Okay, so here we are at the third session, uh, which I've called The Invention of History and the Birth of Tragedy, uh, Herodotus and the Golden Age of Athens. So we're coming into the uh, sweet spot of the period. And, and really, uh, we are going to be locked into one century from this point on, uh, beginning around 490 and into the 390s, 380s uh, BC. Uh, next week, we're going to be taking a look at Thucydides, Plato after that, Aristotle after that. But uh, moving along, where I wanted to begin, because it's uh, what defines the Greek world in the classical period, is they're establishing their independence from the shadow of the Persian Empire to the east. And we stressed in previous sessions how the great empires of Egypt and whoever was controlling uh, the Fertile Crescent, the Tigris and Euphrates valleys, were civilizations that were far larger and far senior to the Greek world, and which the Greek world recognized as uh, culturally significant and certainly militarily significant. And Persia becomes the focus of uh, this week, essentially because they've established control in the sixth century over the entire swath of Western Asia onto the European continent and into Africa by dominating Egypt in this period. And they did it under the rule of uh, the Achaemenid clan, the, the family that give us uh, Cyrus and Cambyses and Darius and Xerxes. And there's a family tree on the right. And under the auspicious leadership of a number of these kings of kings, the shahs, as they were calling themselves by this point, uh, the Persians established a phenomenally wealthy multi-ethnic empire that spans from Egypt to uh, India. And they organize this world as uh, a series of provincial governorships of uh, satrapies, as they called them, and the governor was called a satrap, who was usually chosen from the local ethnic leadership. So they, they took from the locals, because remember, there are maybe 50 major languages spoken in this swath of the world that they're occupying. Uh, this bubble chart that somebody, um, that I stumbled across, and I was happy to see that somebody had taken the trouble to do it, takes descriptions of Herodotus as to where the major wealth of tribute to the Persian monarchy was coming from in support of all the armies uh, across the empire. And the bubbles represent the scale of the wealth. And you'll see places like uh, Western India, of, uh, which may not have been expected, outrival even the Fertile Crescent of what is modern Iraq itself and Egypt as sources of wealth. But I do want to point out that a tremendous tribute was weighing down the Western coast of Turkey which the Greeks uh, had settled and which is usually referred to as Ionia in this period. And I'm gonna look at maps that give us a much closer picture of this. Uh, the Greek cities were among the tributary places in the Persian empire and many Greeks um, fought, especially in the, the Persian navy uh, because of their uh, ability and, and, and seamanship because they had always been a coastal population. The 
local Greeks who would have been drawn into the service of the Persians were usually in the in the policies of of the of Ionia. They were usually uh, tyrannoi or tyrants on the Greek political model. People who they may not have been tyrannical, as I, but tyrant was the word given to uh, the ward healer, if you will, if, if you're going to use an old uh, New York political term, the, the, the strong guy, the guy who could control the neighborhood, uh, the, the one in charge, the head gang member, if you will. And this bubble chart represents... Um, the empire in the period of Darius. So Darius's uh, Floroid period would have been from the 520s all the way down into the 490s. And uh, his footprint in the Greek world was large. But I also want to point out that Greece, which we think of as this up and coming seminal civilization is something of an afterthought in the Persian mind. It's out here on the fringes. Uh, yes, it's on the Mediterranean, but a, a lot of other places, including Egypt, are also on the Mediterranean. And, uh, and it's not the source of a great deal of Persian wealth. And so one would think that Previous to this period, uh, the Greek world would not have created much of an impression on the Persian world. And that was largely true until the period we finally come into. And uh, this little image on the lower left of a gold derrick, they minted their own currency. It was minted in various places, including in Ionia. And so there was a trade currency. The modern much more modern Silk Road and Spice Roads would have come the trade routes that that would have persisted all the way into the Middle Ages when Marco Polo would have tracked through them uh, right through the middle of this Persian establishment. Anyhow, to give a sense, uh, and I, I, I tried to do that in this slide, to give a sense of the uh, the power and the cultural achievement of Persia in this period. This reconstruction of the palace of Darius at Susa, one of the, cent the, the several uh, palace cities that the Persians established around the region, is phenomenal and probably something that could not have been built using Greek technology. Uh, in the same period and would not have been matched again until the Romans developed the use of mortar and, and could change how buildings hung together. Uh, Darius is shown in a Persian relief. Darius is shown on a Greek vase, uh, the king of kings. And on his tomb, I could have shown you the actual photograph instead of this kind of hieroglyph of it. But on Darius's tomb, very tellingly, let me expand this, is a representation of the many ethnic groups and their various languages that comprise the makeup of his kingdom and his army. So you see Persians and Medians and Elamites and Parthians and Aryans on the, on the Indian border, Bactrians, Sogdians, etc., all the way into, into uh, Western, Central and Western India. And down here, uh, Babylonians, Assyrians, Arabs, Egyptians, Armenians, Cappadocians, and then uh, not to be uh, stinted, the Ionians themselves, the Greeks served in the army uh, and were considered citizens of the empire and Libyans and Ethiopians, etc. cetera, Carians, people, people who occupied uh, the, the main uh, central mountain regions of Turkey. So this was a truly international empire 
modeled on uh, that that top down uh, orientalist structure as Wittfogel, we talked about it last time or the, or the session before that as as Carl Wittfogel depicted it, one of the civilizations where the citizenry of of any local level is far removed from the corridors of power at the top. A very hierarchical, very layered society, again, picking up to bring it into focus, the message that we were looking at last week in contrast with the, the small, uh, almost, almost town-like status of the Greek city-states in which whoever was of influence and in power was someone that a fellow Greek citizen uh, could engage within the assembly of that city. So, so a much different experience of the universe depending, depending where you were. Now, between 500 and 480, 479 to be specific, there are two major wars and, and one would-be war to, that begins the whole thing, begun with the revolt of the Ionian cities. Here's Western Turkey in the map on the right. And here are cities that are largely um, Greek. This map, by the way, was in Spanish. It's the, it's the best one I could find. So the names are going to be, instead of Harlequinasso, you see Harlequinasso, and Miletus, and Ephesus, etc. cetera. Uh, Klazomene, you know, all the way up and down the coast, these places were probably um, some of the richest, most successful cities in the Greek world. And they resented the obligations that they had to the Persian Empire. And whenever they saw an opening, uh, they would try to conspire uh, to revolt. And they were usually uh, abetted in, in these strategies by Athens, which was the major capital of the Ionian linguistic group within the Greek world from which many of these cities were founded. So they felt real ties to Attica and Achaia, sections of eastern mainland Greece. And the, the cities, with the help of the Athenians, rise up and they, they burn out Sardis, which is inland a little bit. There's, you see a little speck on the map in the middle. This precipitates a war, an invasion. It wakes Persia up. Who are these gnats on the western border? Who, who seem to be uh, wrestling with the idea of breaking away. And Darius is the first, to, the first emperor to engage, the first king to engage. And he sends a general, Mardonius, who stages a land attack, who takes northern Greece and Macedon, um, and then is forced to withdraw. He, he hits obstacles. There's a famous battle at Marathon uh, where Philippides, the famous first marathoner, runs all the way back to Athens to announce 26 miles to announce the victory. But the real defeat came about um, because Athenian sea power could keep the land army from Persia from reaching certain objectives, and, and which led the Persians to understand full well that if they were going to be successful, they were going to uh, have to develop a navy of substance and scale as well as a land force. And the second invasion, Darius dies in 486 before the reorganization takes place. Xerxes 
his son and successor, organizes a massive expeditionary force and invades in 480. About a tenth of the Greek cities, the Palais, joined an alliance led by two leading, uh, leading cities, Athens of the Ionian group and, and on the Peloponnese, Sparta, the, the old military oligarchy um, that controlled and led a lot of like-minded cities around the Peloponnese. So the Athenian strength, of course, was their fleet. They had built the long walls all the way down to Piraeus, so that even if their, their city uh, was put under siege, they could, they could uh, retreat to the fleet. And there was much disorganization about who should take the leadership of the group. There was a huge rivalry between the Spartan. The Spartans usually had two kings uh, from two different clans. Leonidas being, being one of them at this point. And the, the Greek democracy led in this generation by this incredibly talented strategist called Themistocles um, could not agree as to when and where to meet the Persian invasion. Uh, the Persians, of course, when they saw the size, uh, uh, excuse me, the Spartans, when they saw the size of the Persian army and felt that they would be, you know, certainly undermanned at home, decided that what they really wanted to do was retreat to the Isthmus of Corinth, which is that little neck of land, if you can see it there between Attica and the Peloponnesus and the Isthmus of Corinth and, and, and sort of garrison it to keep the Persians from getting onto the Peloponnese. And, and the idea was the Athenians, their idea was that the Athenians should use their fleet to keep the Persians from coastal landings to force them to come across the Isthmus. Themistocles says, well, uh, I'm not sure about that idea because it would leave the city of Athens entirely exposed. You're throwing us to the wolves. So while this bickering is going on and the Persian army was moving from Thrace to Macedonia and down the coast of Thessaly towards uh, the big cities, the uh, Greeks decided even though they couldn't all be there at, at this time because of religious festivals and political infighting for leadership and bickering between the different cities and among the different cities, they uh, decide they've got to slow the fleet up off the coast, which the Athenians take on, and, um, and they've got to slow down the onslaught on land before it can reach the main, the main city areas. And, and there's a passageway through the pass at Thermopylae that uh, they can slow, they can buy time for the Athenian fleet to get into place around several of the harbors in, in, in southern Greece. And to buy time, the Spartan force that has arrived at the last second, and it's a tiny force. It's If we're to believe Herodotus, it's outnumbered by something like 100 to 1. Uh, Leonidas sends some of the other allies home, thinking um, that they're not going to help much anyhow, and he and his 300 Spartans will blockade and hold the pass, which they do for three days, which buys enough time for the Athenians to get their, their uh, fleet into place. And, and this famous battle, the uh, Persians are shown by a shepherd how to get around the back of the ridge and attack uh, the Spartans from behind. And, and there is this legendary uh, self-sacrifice of the 300 Spartans, which Herodotus makes a huge deal of, 
because it's 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 something really out of the Iliad, and and there's enough in Herodotus that still wants to sing the songs of the the legendary heroes to to promote Leonidas and his troops into um, heroic figures, and there is this is followed by an Athenian naval victory which convinces uh, Xerxes to himself to personally withdraw to Asia and and then which is at the Battle of Salamis and then in 479 uh, the Spartan and Athenian allies defeat another the remnant of the Persian army under Mardonius in a major land battle at Plataea and the war was effectively over and um the Persians, whether they thought they were defeated or not, decided these Greeks are too much trouble at this point. And, and really the Eastern Mediterranean is, and its control is ceded to the Greeks. And to the degree that means uh, ceded to Greek sea power, it's Athens that will, that will come out of this up with the greatest prowess and and the greatest position for uh, controlling the Greek world. Uh, This map sort of encapsulates everything that I've just been talking about. Uh, The Persian Empire in Turkey, you see these little red uh, explosion points where, where the Ionian revolt began uh, everything in that orange color was Persian controlled. Uh, Macedonia or Macedonia was a vassal state of Persia from that slightly earlier period. A number of Greek states on the mainland, Anatolian, Thessaly, and Epirus, uh, stayed neutral. Uh, the blue color is uh, encapsulates both the Athenian controlled region and its islands, and Sparta and its control of the Peloponnesus and the Argolid. And and the lines show where the two invasions uh, traveled by sea and and then down, down the coast. And in the great battle of Salamis, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, we find, it's too bad I couldn't have you read that section from Herodotus in which he shows, in contrast to Xerxes, it's interesting, Herodotus sets up this tremendous contrast between Xerxes as this imperial orientalist king, top-down commands, um, that people be killed when they get in their way, when there's a storm at sea and they and they can't launch their navy, he, he symbolically has uh, some of his men whip the sea and they come to the shore with chains and they whip the sea because I am Xerxes, king of kings. And the contrast between that and the Athenian leader Themistocles, who can only arrange to have the battle fought in the Bay of Salamis, where he understands the Athenian navy might have an advantage by deceiving both the Spartans and the Persians. He's, it's, it's the Greek mind, the wily politician, the manipulator, the godfather, the man who's got a pit uh, ally against ally and allies against the enemy in clever ways to, to make it look like uh, it's to the Persian advantage, to make it look to the Persians as if it's the Persian advantage to engage them in the harbor and, and to make it look to the Spartans like uh, we have to have the battle here 
because the Persians want it here and will never be able to get a way to defend your coastal areas in time. So your plan of of manning the the Isthmus of Corinth is not going to work. And so you get this this clever, uh, oily, ferret-like politician, this wheeler-dealer who succeeds in establishing a plan that leads to an Athenian victory contrasted with this top-down, commandeering, uh, insensitive, uh, despotic model of the Asian king, Xerxes. And, and, and already you can see at play a kind of self-conscious contrasting of the Greek world with the Persian world, with the, which is the Asian world. And it's written by a citizen of Halicarnassus. You see it on the map on the southwest coast of Turkey. Uh, Herodotus is from a place that is Greek, but is also uh, part of the Persian Empire. With, with Persian garrisons all around. He's, he's raised in this multicultural world. And, and one of the combatants in the army of Xerxes, one of the naval commanders, is the queen of Halicarnassus, Artemisia. And Herodotus, as the faithful hometown boy, although she's fighting for the other side, gives her a heroic role and an insightful role in the battle. She's the one naval captain in the Persian fleet that doesn't look like an idiot. Uh, so here is a man, a historian, poised between the two worlds, very knowledgeable about the both worlds, as he is also of Egypt, who who sets up, whether consciously or unconsciously, I tend to think it's very conscious on his part, this contrast between the imperial model and the personalities that it, it generates in a Xerxes with all of the excesses that he attributes to Xerxes and, and the Greek model of the clever, nimble, um, Man on his feet. It's it's uh, Sonny Liston and Muhammad Ali. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Anyhow, at the end of the Persian Greek wars, the Greek world, in effect, for the first time, is a, simultaneously established. It is something. It is a place. And, um, and it's an independent place. And so for the next 50 years, between 480, 479, and 431, which is the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, uh, this 50-year period, the, uh, you see it in the heading in the first bullet here, the Pentecontetia, the 50-year period, is a golden age. It is the classical golden age. It's the age of Pericles. It's the age of great leadership and thriving success on the part of both the Spartans and their allies and uh, the Athenians and their allies, the so-called Delian League. We'll look at the map in a moment. So this is the period that... Um, The curriculum of the Greek world, as it is handed to us, goes into its really um, accelerated development. This is the period uh, that will lead us into the use of prose literacy, Herodotus being the very first one, and the great histories of, of Thucydides, and then the more mature philosophical 
theorizing of, of Plato, who's born right at the end of this period, and Aristotle, who is a generation later. So, but this is the beginning of the formation, the crystallization of, of the great uh, curriculum that's going to become the foundation of the intellectual life of Western civilization. Athens, the clear beneficiary of military success is Athens. It emerges as a major sea power and it consolidates a colonial island empire called the Delian League because they meet on the island of Delos. It's a league um, but it's an Athenian empire, you know, under the guise of, um, of sort of a democratically organized group of associates, there is the heavy handed control of Athens within its league. In the previous century, the democracy wherever on the Athenian model, wherever it had been developed or wherever it had migrated to, had been tested by uh, severe economic stratification, which caused a lot of class warfare, The what the Greeks themselves called stasis. And between the two groups, the aristoi, the, the, the well-off, the people with the money, and the hoi poloi, the many, uh, the horde, the great unwashed, this resulted in extended periods of the hoi polloi being controlled by demagogues and, and who established themselves as tyrannoi, as tyrants. In the age of Pericles, 480 to 430, after the Persian Wars, Athenian material success, their economic and financial leadership in the Delian League, blunted class stress. So it allowed a democracy led by the best men, people like Pericles, to nourish an intellectual revolution. So in effect, what was a, a cats and dogs at each other's throats, uh, small city democracy of the previous century, now with the success of, of the economy has allowed all boats to float. And, and, and in this world, uh, men like Pericles, who really were, he was an, a so-called um, Alcmaeonid, he's from a famous clan, and people, the common man in the street, the, the, the member of the Hoi Polloi, do not resent the father figure of Pericles uh, because the city is doing fine. It's, so, so we have, if you will, if I could stretch the model of a, a, a man with an aristocratic accent, a Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who the poor workers on the street think is their spokesperson because things are going well. Anyhow, Sparta, the other victorious city in the Persian Wars, was still this military oligarchy, and it led a land-based league uh, around the Peloponnese. So you'll see in the map on the right, if I expand that a little bit, uh, the yellow areas are the Delian League, which are the Athenian-controlled allies, and you see it's the coastal rim of the Persian Empire of, on Turkey. It is the islands and the Cyclades and the Aeolian Islands um, spreading all the way back to the mainland. And there on uh, the Peloponnese itself is the Peloponnesian League, the Spartan League. Now, I haven't said much so far in, in this course on Spartan political organization. It was very militarist. Uh, people were expected uh, to not, the best people were expected not to uh, 
be involved in commercial enterprises. The military organization uh, led the society. It was a rigidly controlled education, was rigidly controlled. Uh, the stories that were told even in antiquity, and we find many of them in Herodotus, but we find them all over literature when, when, when prose begins to expand. The stories and legends of, of Spartan discipline, of um, the young boy who steals a fox from somewhere in, in the village and has been raised with the kind of discipline uh, not to reveal that he is the culprit and, and the fox is hidden under his cloak and, and sort of chews through his half of his back and, and, and he doesn't whimper and he doesn't reveal indeed that he's had anything to do with the event. This kind of, the same kinds of stories that will, that will gain currency in the Roman Republic in the early period of, um, which maybe in a future course, we'll get a chance to look at uh, the legends of people like um, Muki Skywala, who, who uh, is sent out to assassinate the Etruscan king who's advancing on the, the then town of Rome. And he's captured and dragged in front of the, Etrus the Etruscan military leader and, and um, who questions him. And, he, and he's in the camp in front of the campfire and he walks up and sticks his hand in the fire in front of the uh, Etruscan king who's interrogating him and, until his hand begins to burn off. And he announces to the king, there are 300 more like me coming to kill you. Uh, but th this, this sense of we can endure anything. We are, we are, we are the Marines. And, and, and the Spartan mentality, which Athenians contrast themselves to all the time, is very much this way. Athenians will say, we don't have to embrace that kind of discipline. We volunteer when fighting needs doing, and at the same time, we can have a high culture as a result of that. Um, we are not, we are a, not a military camp the way you guys are. So, born towards the end of the Persian Wars, not quite at the end, it was right before Xerxes brings his army over, is Herodotus of Halicarnassus, born in 484. His histories, historiae, were the first written prose account of this kind. This is it. This is arguably the first real prose book of any kind ever written. And in 445, he gives public readings from the book at the Odeon, the, the arena for song, the, the Odeon of Athens, the singing place. On the surface, there are narrative of the wars with Persia and consistent with the traditional goals of heroic epic poetry. So he's still in that tradition. And those traditional goals are memory, glory, and education. And he, he says, these are the, right at the beginning, these are the researches of Herodotus of Polycarnassus, which he publishes in the hope of thereby preserving from decay the remembrance of what men have done, memory, mnemosyne, and of preventing the great and wonderful actions of the Greeks and the barbarians from losing their due share of glory. And with all to put on record, what were the grounds of feud? And that's in his introduction. But they're also a radical departure from epic goals and epic intentions. First of all, there is the naturalism that he brings to bear. He aims to give a documented objective account of his subject 
without the embellishments or exaggerations of epic poetry. Despite a, a, a fragile grasp of what we would call evidence, he's a stickler about naming his sources and examining their possible motives. So he gives us a critical analysis of, of, of many of the motives. I don't know whether you, ha I, I didn't include it in this part of the presentation, but if you had a chance to look at that PDF of um, some selections from Herodotus, that little section on his discussion of the sources of the Nile, where does all that water come from? And he talks about, well, there are those who told me among the priests, you know, that, that it's the melting of snows south of here in the mountains. And, and which by the way is correct. And, and then he dismisses, he gives about four theories for what it could be. And he dismisses the accurate one because he says, well, you know, I look at my sources, but they've got to be wrong because it's hot down there. That's Central Africa down there. And he dismisses the possibility of it. But the strength of it is that he's looking at these sources and he's talking about them out loud. He's not just assuming the mantle of um, accuracy for one or the other. He's saying, here are five suppositions or four suppositions. And let me talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of each one. He's doing what a historian is supposed to do. He's doing historiography. He's saying, well, in this hand, this could be the case, but here's why I doubt. Here's why I like it. Here's why I doubt it. And, and uh, it's naturalistic thinking born right in front of us. His treatment of the others, the, the, the Zenoi, the Barbaroi, the foreigners, the barbarians, he transcends the parochialism of tribal identity. He's not just Greek. He's born of mixed ancestry, by the way. I think on his mother's side, he's Carrion. And he takes pride in that. By introducing the Greek audience to the major civilizations of the Persian Empire, he intends to establish the often superior cultural accomplishments of those places. So he'll tell us, oh, what the Egyptians have done with the calendar is way better than what we do with it. And what the, some of the Persians, some of the Magi do with astronomy is way better than anything we make of it. And as I mentioned before, although writing for an Athenian audience, here he is, the hometown boy. He makes Queen Artemisia a central commander and counselor in Xerxes' army. So he's moving right along. Now, just to look at a, a couple excerpts from him, um, the bits on cultural relativism, the fact, the way he's able to bring a critical eye to bear on the strengths, weaknesses, limitations of one's own society, one's own mentality, one's own frame of mind, or the others. So he says, for if one were to offer men to choose out of all the customs in the world, such as seem to them the best, they would examine the whole number and end up by preferring their own. So convinced are they that their own usages far surpass those of all others. He says, we're, we're parochialists at heart. I'm admitting that. I'm trying to deal with my own limitations here. Unless, therefore, a man was mad, it is not likely that he would make sport of such matters. That people have this feeling about their laws may be seen by very many proofs, among others, by the following. Darius, after he had got the kingdom, called into his presence certain Greeks who were at hand and asked what he should pay them to eat the bodies of their fathers when they died. To which they answered that there was no sum that they would tempt them to do such a thing. He then sent for certain Indians of the race called Calatians, men who eat their fathers and asked at their deaths, while the Greeks stood by and asked them what the Greeks stood by and, and knew by the help of an interpreter all that was said, what he should give them to burn the bodies of their fathers at their decease, the way others might have. And the Indians exclaimed aloud and bade him 
forbear such language, such is men's one herein. And Pindar, the great Greek poet, was right in my judgment when he said, custom, law, nomos, is the king over everyone. So this, the sense that even the early philosophers, the pre-Socratics had established that, that customary thinking, that, that most of what people take for true is essentially a construct of human agency. We make it up as we go. It's Protagoras saying that man is the measure of all things. It's Pindar saying custom or nomos is the king over everyone. Um, nurture, not nature, perhaps. Uh, this comment on Egyptian astronomy. Now, with regard to mere human matters, the accounts which they gave and in which all agreed were the following. The Egyptians, they said, were the first to discover the solar year and to portion out its course into 12 parts. They obtained this knowledge from the stars. And then parenthetically, to my mind, they contrived their year much more cleverly than the Greeks. For those, uh, for these last every other year into Calate a whole month. But the Egyptians dividing the year into 12 months of 30 days each, meaning what? They're only like five and a quarter days off in the solar year, and every year a space of five days besides, whereby the circuit of the seasons is made to return with uniformity. Um, the Greeks, as did the Romans, the Romans were even worse. They had to intercalate two months. They had like 10 months of um, 30 days each, and then they had to throw in a couple of months which, of course, they named after their emperors. So we get July and August. Thank you, emperors. Uh, but I wanted to include this. At the same time, he, he was still so much of an old traditionalist that his description of the Spartan uh, act of bravery at Thermopylae and self-sacrifice uh, is, is something out of Homer. At sunrise, Xerxes made libations after which he waited until the time when the forum is wont to fill and then began his advance. Ephialtes had instructed him thus. This is the guy who tipped the Persians off about the secret way around the mountain, that there's this way that's much quicker and shorter than the way around the hills and the ascent. So the barbarians and to Xerxes began to draw nigh and the Greeks under Leonidas, as they now went forth determined to die, advanced much further than on previous days until they reached the more open portion of the pass. Hitherto they had held their station within the wall and from this had gone forth to fight at the point where the pass was the narrowest. Now they joined the battle beyond the defile and carried slaughter among the barbarians who fell in heaps. Behind them, the captains of the squadrons this is on the Persian side, armed with whips. Remember, the army's comprised of many nationalities saying, hey, how come we're up here in the front lines? So there'd be sergeants in back of them with whips driving them on, urge their men forward with continual blows. Again, this contrast of, of Greek selfless heroism uh, against the imperial beast. Many were thrust into the sea and there perished. A still greater number were trampled to death by their own Soldiers, no one heeded the dying. For the Greeks, reckless of their own safety and desperate since they knew that as the mountain had been crossed, their destruction was nigh at hand, exerted themselves with the most furious valor against the barbarians. By this time, the spears of the greater number were all shivered, and with their swords, they hewed down the ranks of the Persians. And here as they strove, Leonidas fell fighting bravely together with many other famous Spartans. And then this astonishing phrase, which unless you're reading it with close attention, you might miss. Whose names I have taken care to learn on account of their great worthiness, as indeed I have those of all the 300. This little modest remark, I, Hieronymus, have memorized and can recite the names of all 300 Spartans who fell at Thermopylae to honor, to have, to be pious and reverent 
towards this act of glory. This is so, you, you could have heard a hero in, in Homer saying this line. Another of the 300 is likewise said to have survived the battle, a man named Pantites, whom Leonidas had sent on an embassy into Thessaly. He, they say, on his return to Sparta, found himself in such disesteem that he hanged himself. You left? You left? Shame. And so he hung himself. Very very classic. On Persian religion, the customs which I know the Persians to observe are the following. They have no images of the gods, no temples, nor altars, and consider the use of them a sign of folly. These are the, they're Zoroastrian. Ahura Mazda. This comes, I think, from their not believing the gods to have the same nature with men. As the Greeks imagine. They don't anthropomorphize. Their want, however, is to ascend the summits of the loftiest mountains and there to offer sacrifice to Jupiter, the great god. They're, they're, they're more or less monotheists, which is the name they give to the whole circuit of the firmament. And, and so um, you have um, this sense that there might be superior religion among the Persians. And then this, this historiographical comment on the dating of the Homeric epics. Whence the gods severally sprang, whether or no they had all existed from eternity, what forms they bore, these are questions of which the Greeks knew nothing until the other day. Greek religion is something that was trumped up last Tuesday, he says, so to speak. For Homer and Hesiod were the first to compose theogonies and give the gods their epithets to allot them their several offices and occupations and describe their forms. And they lived, Homer and Hesiod, but 400 years before my time, as I believe. He's, he's actually right. They, they lived maybe 350 years, but he had it down to about four centuries. And he was correct. As for the poets who are thought by some to be earlier than these, they are, in my judgment, decidedly later writers. He's, he's correct again. And these matters, I have the authority of the priestesses of Dodona for the former portion of my statements. And then in this wonderful line again, what I have said of Homer and Hesiod is my own opinion. I figured this out, gang. I am a historian. I'm doing something different. So the histories... It's the first great prose work in Greek. It's intended to be read, read, not sung. Remember everything we said about literacy last week, not sung or recited. And instead of sweeping, remember that chant I played for you last week? Instead of sweeping you along in the moment of imaginative uh, identification with the hero, it's slow, it stops. It makes arguments and counterarguments. It gives evidence. It names sources. All this while still retaining some of the Homeric values. So we see that we owe to Herodotus, in a sense, is this first step towards cultural anthropology, other cultures sympathetically depicted, credit given to the creativity of other cultures, Greek religion sourced from Egypt and Asia. And evidence prized more than tradition, accurate historical placement of Homer, investigation of the Nile flooding. The evidence can be thin at times. In fact, in antiquity, he was often referred to, since he's the first one, he sounds more like Aesop's fables than, than some later figures do. And so he was nicknamed by some the father of lies, even though he is actually more accurate than ancient, other ancients thought him to be. Anyhow, let us move, then you and I, to the birth of tragedy. Where does this go? I wish we had had a chance to read one, but uh, life is short. If you get a chance, probably the greatest 
literary explosion of the last 25 centuries was the writing of the tragedians, only a fraction of which do we still have uh, that hasn't been lost to us in a period of about 80 years. Um, it's as if it's as if there were three or four or five Shakespeare's all appearing in the same place at the same time. Anyhow, tragedy evolves from the dithyram, which is a rhythmic choral hymn, a religious hymn done rhythmically and hypnotically. Plato will attack the dithyrams later on in honor of the god Dionysus, who is the god of wine and fertility. It was performed at religious festivals called Dionysia, Dionysia, that featured processions, Pompeii, pomp and circumstance, Pompeii, in which phalluses, phalloi, were carried along with offerings of bread and wine. He's the fertility god. You carry images of erect phalluses, and, and Dionysian art is just covered with such imagery. In the sixth century, the performance of choral dithyrams was expanded to include acting. So instead of just a chorus gathering and at the Odeon and singing them at the end of the procession, during and after the end of the procession, some sections of it were acted out by a single actor, usually. And according to tradition, a composer of some dithyrams, who was also an actor named Thespis, there was a real Thespis, Thespians are named for a real guy, began to act out parts of the song's narrative. Legend has it that he also introduced uh, the use of masks, which uh, the masks could have been so uh, one actor could depict several different roles depending which mask he picked up. And so people up in the cheap seats could see who that was talking or singing at that point. The name tragedy. Uh, tragodia derives from tragos, goat, and ode, song. It may, goat song. It may derive from the awarding of a goat as the prize for the best performance or from the sexual character of the processions. I mean, there's much, and the goat was always associated with, with uh, sexuality, even in the Christian period. The goat was a common symbol for Dionysus and, and libidinous satyrs. Those half men, half beasts were stock characters, half goat, half men in the festivals. Now, Dionysus has an ecstatic revenue at Theasus. So he's followed by um, his crew, his posse, if you will. That includes women, maenads or bacchants, as they're called who are driven into frenzy with wild dancing and intoxication. And the frenzy leads them to, to acts of sexuality and slaughter. In the rituals, they dress in animal skins, which they've killed or sacrificed, and wear ivy wreaths or snakes. Um, Again, phallic images and, and images of nature around them all the time. And the term Dionysian then and now has always connoted irrationality and, and if you will, the dark side. As, and it's always contrasted with, with the, the, the rational or Apollonian uh, thinking and style of, of, of thought. Uh, the Great Dionysia, or sometimes called the Greater, there were these processions all over the place. There were the rural ones that were done out in the farm districts. But the one that came into Athens, because it was the big deal, this is, this is the St. Patrick's Day Parade, was called the Great or Greater Dionysia. Process from Eleutheria to Athens with a great phallus in tow to celebrate the Athenian acceptance of the god's cult. Dionysus is a later god. He, he would not have been a god in, in, in before the Archaic period. He's, he comes new to the Olympians. The festival becomes a great civic event lasting days 
and and there are games and and there there are plays put on and eventually include public sacrifices and competitions for the best tragedies and the best commentary. The images on the right, if we could look at them, I tried to take stuff from contemporary imagery. So from vase painting, here's Dionysus. He's the God, he's bigger than everybody else with his theosis. Here he is with his posse and their main ants. And there's a satyr and we always can tell the satyr by the tail and the erection. Uh, here's a maenad and a satyr. Uh, the imagery of vase painting is filled with such references. And here's this wonderful, in, in a white depiction, maenad um, with her animal skins and her staff and the snake tied around her head. And, and this is the, the source of where the, the dramas are going to develop from. The conventions, so the use of masks, only three male speakers were permitted on the stage. So masks permitted each actor, and th this is even at the end of the tradition. Uh, initially, there was only one actor in the We'll, we'll see how that develops. Uh, so each actor can play multiple characters, including female characters, female roles. The outdoor theaters or arenas were large. Masks helped the audience recognize the characters. Here is a mask of Zeus. The gods were characters. Uh, the competition format at the Great Dionysia, three poets submitted three tragedies on a single theme. They were usually linked. So, it, it, and sometimes the action followed serially. They were like mini series, um, or sometimes there are gaps in, in um, time, but it was still built around the same character at different points of that character's development. So there'd be three tragedies and a single so-called satyr play a burlesque on some heroic subject as, they say, comic relief. They were performed in a single day. People got to the theory, the theater, excuse me, soon after dawn. And then they would watch with breaks for food and I guess bathroom breaks and whatever, all day long to dusk. And at some point, I don't know whether it was after the third tragedy or between the second and third, that there would be the sadder play to keep the audience, um, which must have been a pretty, being in an audience must have been a pretty tense experience um, to keep them relaxed and amused. The, and from 486 on, that was also a competition for single comedies. But originally, three tragedies and a sadder play the same poet, by the way, never wrote both tragedies and comedies, as opposed to back in the days of the Satter play. Um, and there were three poets. So this would go on for three days. So you can imagine what it was like. Can you, can you imagine what it was like that each year you would have the equivalent of uh, a Shakespearean trilogy each day for three days running? And it... It must have been both exhilarating and exhausting simultaneously. Uh, the structural and thematic evolution. So the first of the great tragedies, he wasn't the first tragedian, he was the first of the great tragedians, born in about 525, is Aeschylus, lives to be about 70. Um, lives through the Persian Wars, I think fights in the Persian Wars, and uh, dies during the Golden Age. He established the single-themed trilogy format, and he added a second actor to create dramatic tension. The tragic events were couched in a strong religious sensibility, so there was a moral or ethical lesson in the tragic fall morality. So, and, and I, as I say here, think of Orestes 
being pursued by the Furies for the murder of his mother, Clytemnestra. Um, so what you so you get a theme built around a man who can't not a god. He can't be a man that cannot be identified with. He's got to be a victim of a moral failure on his own part or some flaw or some trick of fate, um, as we get with Oedipus, um, or something that could happen to a, a flawed, limited human being like you or me for full on audience identification. Sophocles, who is an entire generation later and lives to be a grand old man from four nine, but he, he, he covers most of the fifth century. He added a third actor and expanded the chorus. He's also said to have introduced scenery and dramatic scenes. So all of a sudden things were organized around visual presentations that were broken up. Let's bring on Let's bring on some business to the stage. Let's, let's remove some sets and bring on some others. Let us have scenery, as they call it. There was a greater emphasis on character development and Sophocles and in the human condition. So with Sophocles, we get the idea that not only does something happen to a character, but that that character is somehow changed by the experience. And, and as I say here, think of Oedipus. And at one point, the chorus says of Oedipus, not to be born is best because life leads you down these tragic, twisty ways. And then, and then there is, again, almost a generation later, the great Euripides, who who in full Dionysian mode. Now, this man, now Sophocles was an old man at the point of the beginning of the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens. Euripides is a much younger man during that period. And the chaos of the Peloponnesian War, which we will talk about next week when we read the extraordinary excerpts, and I encourage you to read those from Thucydides, um, a man who's lived through that and who believes deep down, if you've ever read Euripides, that the Dionysian chaos at the root of the human soul is the reality of human nature. It's Medea who can murder her children as an act of vengeance against her unfaithful husband, extreme psychological intensity, an examination of extreme irrationality. And he defies all traditional morality and religion. And, and it, it's suddenly as if within a century, you, you, you moved from the world of John Donne to the world of Samuel Beckett in one great leap. Um, and it's a and it's a dark world. So so there's this progressive movement towards humanism and psychological explanation that tragedy brings to bear. And again, it's because of this this change in mentality brought on by literacy, by criticism, by examination of human nature, that explanations are now spilling out. They're not just philosophical explanations of physics. They're historical explanations of cultural development. They're artistic explanations of human psycho psychology and, and nature, human nature. In this image on the lower right, you have Actors in costume carrying masks. Uh, 
there's Mary Renault was this writer of historical fiction who wrote a series of great historical novels about ancient Greece. And one of them called The Mask of Apollo is about actors in this tradition. And it's a wonderful novel. If anybody wants to kill it, a rainy February or March afternoon. Anyhow, dramatic theory develops, of course, out of the critical sensibilities of people trying to make sense of how art works and standing alone in that space for a while, or, or not standing alone, well, Plato, Plato enters it also, but the one who's most famous in his poetics for trying to explain how art and tragedy in particular work is Aristotle, who analyzes tragedy in terms that still resonate. Mimesis, remember, imitation, and catharsis, purgation. Tragedy is therefore an imitation of a noble and complete action, which through compassion and fear produces purification of the passions. You're there in the dark movie theater and, and you're identified with a noble figure who must pursue their mission and your heart's in your throat, and you're pulling for them against the evils and unknowns and, and dark forces that lie in around them, and you come through this with a sense of exhaustion and exhilaration. You have had the experience, says Aristotle. The spectator is intended to identify with a significant high barn or mythological figure, the protagonist, the, the one you're supposed to be for. An agon is a struggle. A play is built around an agon, a contention. There is the antagonist and the protagonist, the for and the against. The protagonist whose actions, whether culpable or not, lead to a disastrous conclusion. The hamartia, the tragic flaw, may be an inherent defect in character, a failure of judgment, or a simple error of ignorance to evoke the ideal measure of pity or fear. The spectator must find the protagonist relatable, neither too good or too depraved. So I created this little model up here. So Aristotle, we'll talk about Aristotle in the last session, but he is so prolific writing about everything under the sun that I couldn't resist um, bringing his poetics to bear on the idea of what tragedy was doing. And his plot structure, there is some incident that, you know, everything's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. There is an inciting incident there is an unfolding chain of events, and it leads up to a peak where there is a plot reversal, a change of fortune, a moment of recognition. Could be any of these. It's it's the, the tragic point. The mimesis has reached its its arch, acme, its high point, and then. As a result of whatever happened, there's this denouement all the way down to whatever the horrible ending awaits, the blinding of the character, the catharsis, the purge of pity and fear. And we are left at the end, drained and, of course, exhilarated, knowing more, as Aristotle points out, about the character, but knowing more about oneself. And I just quickly described here because it's an early one and it's the only, the Oresteia of Aeschylus, three plays around the character of Orestes, which was done in 458 at the Greater Dionysia, for which I believe he won 
the prize. I hope he won the prize. If this didn't win the prize, I want to I want to get my hands on the trilogy that did. It's the only surviving complete trilogy that we have of any of these guys. We have a play here and a play there, but I say, you know, 80% of it is lost. And what's the prize winner? Ah. And it consists of the Agamemnon, the Libation Bearers, and the Humanities, the three plays. Kleinemnestra, you know, in the, in the background of the story, Agamemnon wants the ships to leave for Troy. And the waters will not let him. The gods keep everything stilled. And he has to find out how to appease the gods. And a great sacrifice must be made. And he is told that only the sacrifice of his daughter, Iphigenia, uh, will appease the gods and allow the fleet to leave. And so his glory can be pursued at Troy, Iphigenia's mother and the wife of Agamemnon, Clytemnestra, never, of course, forgives him. And so this is where the Oresteia begins. Agamemnon comes back with his concubine, Cassandra, who says, there are bad things happening. She is the voice of Cassandra. As revenge for the sacrifice uh, of the daughter of Iphigenia, Clytemnestra has murdered both of them, Agamemnon and Cassandra. Orestes returns to avenge his father. So he's here to kill his mother on the order of Apollo. Orestes is hunted down, which he does, by the way. Orestes is hunted, and, and not only kills her, but her consort. Orestes is hunted down by the Furies, the three goddesses, the Furies, the fates, if you will, and appeals to Athena, who arranges a judicial trial in Athens. I know I'm accused of killing my mother, but it was justified. But now it's not just going to be an act of vengeance. It's going to be a political trial organized in the new setting of the political state. Orestes is acquitted. The deciding vote is Athena's, who, by the way, is the goddess of Athens, of that polis, who also persuades the Furies to recognize the court. And that's why they're called the Eumenides. Instead of Furies, they are in this play called the, 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 the they're the emissaries of good news and happiness. So classic revenge, the theme you know, the anger, goddess, sing goddess of the anger of Achilleus. Revenge, Homeric justice, is transmuted and has evolved now into judicial law. We are, in, it's not only the story of the Homeric characters that Aeschylus presents, it's the story of the evolution to the civilization represented by his city. That's how we got here. He does this at both levels. I mean, it's just brilliant. And here we have Orestes consulting uh, the goddess at Delphi, where Apollo says, go kill. Go kill your mother. Theaters. Tragedy was rooted in religious ritual and cult. The theaters for its presentation were deliberately situated. You can find this all over the Mediterranean and breathtaking and atmospheric settings. This is, I know this photo is astonishing. I've been here in the daytime on a sunny day with this view, standing almost in the spot where this photo was taken from. And it is spectacular looking out over the plains from Segesta, over the plains of Western Sicily. Down the hill from here is one of the great temples, uh, still intact in Sicily. But this uh, and several others suggest, and have always suggested to me, um, the perfect backdrop to the, the 
ritual and cultish roots, cultic roots of drama and, and the characters they depict. And then in the last slide, more theaters. This is one in the daytime. Here's the theater at Taormina in the upper left with Etna in the distance. And then, of course, the most famous of them all is the theater of Dionysus in Athens, which is at the foot of the Acropolis. So here's the aerial photo with the, the theater in the circle. And, uh, and here's a closer look at it up close. And this one, and again, uh, in many cases later on, they're, of course, they're, they're civic institutions situated for convenience because tragedy had lost by the fourth century its religious vestiges had been transformed into an entertainment, an art and an entertainment. So theaters cropped up everywhere in the Greek world. There was never, as is often the case, there were Greeks writing for theater for the next couple of hundred years. No one comes close to the trio of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides in the following century. It's the way art forms seem to have these moments. You know, you can look at opera from Mozart to Puccini and say, and you could stretch the outer limits on both ends and say Strauss and whatever you want to say. But you can also say, my, the form gets thin after that, doesn't it? Um, Shakespeare is followed by uh, many would-be Shakespeare's. And there we have it. Anyhow, I am going to stop the share. I am going to remove the pen. And if anybody wants to comment or ask a question, feel free because we have about five minutes to the end. So Lou, one quick thing. I'm reading a book called A Thousand Ships, which is uh -huh. the Trojan War from the women's perspective. Uh -huh. The men don't do so well in this book. They, that's also in Euripides, read the Trojan women. Okay, so the <laughs> even, book is very even, interesting, both the Trojan women and the Greek women, and um, the women don't think too much of the men. Totally believable. Certainly Clytemnestra didn't, and I'm sure Iphigenia didn't either. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Lou, how okay. did the Persians deal, given how many peoples they were they conquered and, and were in charge of, how did they deal with the multiple religions and everything and the cultural traditions? Did they just let everybody do their own thing? The Persians? Yeah, they didn't try to impose. Yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, again, Persia, Persians seem to have believed in a high God that evolves into Zoroastrianism um, from a fairly early period and had a tendency towards towards monotheism but um but it's as, as with any other empire it 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 has to adopt a uh, position of tolerance to the locals if it didn't want to have you know total warfare and revolution at its doorstep all the time you have to remember you think, you think of you know um, you know, uh, Catholics or, or um, Muslims trying to impose their religion on the countries that they've taken over. I mean, it's kind of interesting that the Persians didn't do that. They just, if they just let people be, they didn't try to make everybody become Zoroastrians, right? Right. Well, then again, um, I mean, you're, you're right in accusing Christians of, of not being very tolerant that way. Uh, Islam was for several centuries, right. and yeah, and that it it used the tax as long as you were a, a religion of the book. So if you if you were uh, a Judeo Christian, 
you were tolerated and had to pay a special tax, but that was it. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, next week, uh, as I mentioned, the Thucydides, there are some excerpts there that are really worth looking at if you get a chance, especially the extract on the um, plague in Athens at the beginning of the war. It's worth looking at because we're going to tell a story about it. Anyhow, folks, that is today. The Academy of the Empire was really quite remarkable. The, the way that they were able to stitch that together over time. You figure before it, you had the Hittites, the Babylonians, uh, the, uh, the Medes, all those various different groups, and they would rise and fall, rise and fall. But the massive size of that empire and how they maintained it together. Even Alexander, once he conquered that empire, immediately we go into the period of the Diadochi, where they're just fighting among themselves. They can't keep right. that together. It's, it's, it gets yeah. kind of short shrift, the, uh, the Persians. They really did a hell of a job. And they and they come back yet again in the um, early Christian part of antiquity. They become the major rivals to to the Roman Empire yet again. What was that? The Sassanids. Yeah, the Sassanids are Persian. And even Alexander, once he took them over, he wanted to to merge the two cultures. He had such a, a appreciation for them well and the and while much is made of alexander's military victories everybody forgets he was entering a world that had already been domesticated by the persian empire and and so what he was doing was taking over their garrisons after a few strategic battles it it wasn't as if he had to hack it out of new cloth the way the persians themselves had done it what do you think if Alexander hadn't died at such an early age, what he might have been able to have accomplished? Or would he have just fizzled out? Because he was already showing signs mentally of being a little a little on the wacky side. Yeah, I, I, I'd go with the fizzled out. Um, his great gift was bringing the curriculum, the Greek curriculum, to those parts of the world so that Western Asia, Egypt, and the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Mediterranean all got to to add to adopt and add to the new sciences, the new ways of looking at the world, um, the new literatures that were developing all out of the classical model, thanks to Alexander. Okay, then. Let me See. Ask for one more question. I do. Okay. Uh, early in your presentation, you showed a painting uh, that was Persian, and the iconography of the style was very Egyptian, you know, with seeing them from the side and the whole. Uh, yeah, that was also, that was also a style uh, that the earlier Assyrians. Oh, had that's what I wanted to ask you. Developed. And the the Persian use of that was probably based on Assyrian models. All their kings are shown that way. So they're all that that style was used by various cultures then? Oh yeah. Of just showing and it was and it was probably cross-cultural. I mean, I'm not a enough of a an art historian to 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 really speak authoritatively about any of that, but but my guess is that they did have models from other places for themselves. And certainly that side view was, was considered, you know, the last word in imperial art. So it was taken from the Egyptians then. Could have been, because they were doing it really early. Yeah. So the Egyptians took it from the Assyrians? Or do, or... Uh, I I doubt that, but great minds tend to think alike. Mm-hmm. I I I really can't come. It's just that Egyptian art is so old that you would think that other cultures would have seen the Egyptians doing it first. 
That's that's the sense you get. But you said it was you thought it was the Assyrians. No, I thought that the that the Assyrians were probably the Persian model. This is now much later. So here we are in the sixth century BC, and the Persians would have dominated regions that had just been Assyrian controlled within the last couple hundred years before them. So they would have been surrounded by this art where they were. They wouldn't have had to have gotten to Egypt to see it. Yeah, so Egypt's iconography really did influence various. Oh, countries. yeah. Okay. One would think. Yeah. They certainly had some great beards back then. Every representation, they have like a six foot long beard. Well, I know. There must have been, there must have been something to it. It wasn't really <laughs> thing. Well, I don't know. You know, when I when I look at um, modern Afghans and Iranians, there seems to be a lot of hair going on. Yeah, I think the kings, though, they were, they were not necessarily. I think those were put on. They somehow must have had a symbolic meaning. Yeah, I'm sure. I'll have to look it up. I'm, that's just okay, my Lou, you're gonna you're gonna grow a giant beard for us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not capable of it. Do I get extra credit if I look it up? Yeah, there you go. If I research it, do I get extra credit? You get extra credit. Okay. Everybody gets at least an A minus just for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll see everybody next week.